week on Cisco and Ebert, Sandra Bullock and Jason Patrick battled terrorists Willem Dafoe in Speed 2 Cruise Control. Three roommates vow to marry by the age of 30 in Wedding Bell Blues. And Peter Fonda fights to preserve his family from a gang of thieves in Yuli's Gold. A cruise ship is hijacked by a madman, and Sandra Bullock and Jason Patrick struggle to save it in Speed 2 Cruise Control. One of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. When Speed came out in 1994, it was hailed for its freshness and for the appeal of its heroine, Sandra Bullock, who was surprisingly lovable for an action character. Well, she's just as lovable in Speed 2 Cruise Control, but she doesn't have as much to do. The movie's about a villain who hijacks a cruise ship, but Bullock's new boyfriend in the film, played by Jason Patrick, hijacks most of the best action scenes, and Bullock is relegated to the traditional female roles of sidekick and cheerleader. Here's the setup. Willem Dafoe plays a madman named Geiger who believes that a computer company poisoned his blood. I spent a great many years developing computer systems for these cruise lines, including this baby. And then I got tossed away. Jason Patrick is a member of an LAPD SWAT team and wages a one-man war against the takeover. <laughs> is joined by Bullock and Tamora Morrison as the ship's first officer in a desperate plan to jam the runaway ship's propellers. Are you sure this is going to hold? Yeah, we use those lines all over the ship. Yeah, well, guess what? He's not going all over the ship. He's going under the ship, all right? Annie, Annie, Annie. What? It's okay. It'll hold. Here's the guideline. Feed it into the propeller and it'll pull the heavy cable in. Later, the villain steers the ship at an oil tanker. Can Patrick turn the manual controls fast enough to deflect a tragedy? with just the runaway cruise ship. The bad guy takes Bullock hostage and Patrick speeds to the rescue. Glenn Plummer, who had a funny cameo in the first movie, is back as a speedboat owner. He's gonna shoot the plane! Nice shot! Speed 2 Cruise Control was directed by Jan de Bont, the same man who directed the original Speed, and once again, he shows a lot of energy and originality in his special effects. It isn't a great action movie, but it's a very competent one, and it gets the job done. I liked it. I liked it, too. I was a little nervous there with the way you started out. I thought you were going to knock this picture. Nope. Uh, Sandra Bullock, I think is, it's very smart that she's here in a more limited role. She's on the run, she's alive and sexy, and Sandra Bullock has said that she's been overexposed ever since Speed, that she said she was boring herself. She thought mm -hmm. the, and I think that, that there's a conscious effort to limit her in this picture. And also, talk about Jason Patrick for a second. You say he steals the scenes, but he steals them because he's a superior actor. He was in a wonderful film called After Dark, My Sweet about seven years ago, and he's just really yeah, good. Yeah, well, he's a good actor. He's good in a new movie coming out later this year called Love and Death on Long Island, too, that was a big hit at the Cannes Film Festival. But, you know, she was the star, really, right. more than Keanu Reeves, of Speed. So you make a sequel, okay. and you have the same star in the sequel. Why not let her be the star? I, we want to see Sandra no, I, Bullock. I, no, I, I mean, is it good career management to hide someone and to give them smaller roles? I think it's, I think it's, her, I think it's her sense of herself and how she's... I think that they were co-equals yeah, well, in the I first picture. I don't think picture. she should have that. I don't, I don't like the premise. 
that you're making. She was, but she was the discovery. She was the discovery in the first picture. That's true. And, and it's not good it's not career advice to her to say, keep a low profile. We want to see her. We like her. If we don't want to see her, we won't go to her movies. But She's, if we go to a Sandra Bullock movie, that's who we want to see. This isn't a Sandra Bullock movie. This is an action picture with two co-stars, Bullock and, and Jason Patrick, and all three. The ship and the two actors are very yeah, good. But my point is still an excellent one. Only in your head. Our next movie and our next film is another terribly intense personal and tribal drama from New Zealand, a land bursting with its energy in its films. Mm. Broken English is sort of a Romeo and Juliet story of a couple of lovers, not that young, kept apart by family, and here we meet them, an attractive waitress who is a Croatian refugee and a New Zealand native who is a Maori cook. Where are you from? Kawakawa. Kawakawa? Where is that? In South North. Near Whiten? By sea? Sure is. Wow, I love sea. What I like about the film is that the drama in their lives is not some storybook concoction, but torn from the pages of today's news. As she talks about the life she fled in Croatia. The actors are Alexandra Vujicic and Julian Arahanga. This tank, the Serbian tank, came right on the track, railway track, <laughs> meters away from me. <laughs> and it was major panic. Everyone started to yell and shout at me like, run, go, put the chemo, we'll shoot, we'll shoot, go. The big problem in the film, her violent father played magnificently by Rade Serbedzia. He wants no one to touch his daughter, let alone what he considers a foreigner, when of course he himself is the foreigner in New Zealand. For example, you don't know anything about us, who we are, what we are. Told me about it. No, you could never understand it. Broken English is a powerful experience. The film is rated NC-17 adults only for a most enthusiastic sex scene, but the scene isn't exploitive. It's in keeping with the full tilt attitude of this movie. None of the characters holds back any emotion. At times that seems overdone maybe in a scene or two, but a constant and most impressive quality of Broken English is that at no time did I think I was seeing anything but real people photographed almost in a newsreel style. Oh, the pain that nationalism and racism deliver and keep delivering. That's the mournful cry of Broken English. It sure is, and it really is a good film. And you know that father was also the star of Before the Rain, playing really a character that was 180 degrees off from this one. He's a powerful yeah. presence. You know, the movie is very subtle because it's about something else, too, and that is kind of unacknowledged and unrealized incest. There's a scene where she uh, flirts with her father, with her brother, with all the members of her family, and her fiancé says, do you always sit on those guys' laps? I mean, after all, she's a little old yes. for that stage. And there's something going on there. The father's jealousy is possessive as well. And when he takes a baseball bat after the guy who's dating his other daughter, right. uh, there's that too. So we have this, this, this patriarch who has transplanted his entire family from Croatia to New Zealand and is transplanted along uh, with all of the ethnic strife from that country, also his own interior Problem. So it's a really interesting film on that, on that it, basis. It's very good. And I'll tell you, I know people that have character traits like this man. I've seen them. Mm -hmm. And they even look this way, mm -hmm. armed with their beard and their... You know, you know, Mustache. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Have you seen that kind of personality? Uh, yeah, but you don't want to generalize. I and know. At the same time, I'm tempted to. It almost seems like everybody who has this kind of an attitude also has a big mustache. Now I'm going to get mail, right? Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, we got the not. mustache okay. police oh, no, but that's are on okay. the way. I, I take it back. I didn't mean it. I, ex <laughs> I, let's not distract from the film. It's a good film. You when bet. we come back, Peter Fonda tries to hold his family together in Yuli's Gold. I've forgotten how to deal with new things, new feelings, new people. Have they been bad? They deserve to die? No. No, Penny, they did not. Peter Fonda plays a Florida beekeeper and Vietnam veteran now caring for two grandchildren in Yuli's Gold, a strong and subtle film that contains the best acting of Fonda's career. He lives a fiercely independent life as a proud loner in the Florida panhandle and is deeply wounded by the fact that his son is serving a prison sentence for robbery. Here he goes to visit the son, played by Tom Wood, who asks him a favor. The son's wife, a drug addict, has turned up at the home of the two men who are his accomplices in the robbery. That's why you gotta go get her right now while we know where she is before Eddie or Ferris do something. Get her. Yuli brings home the daughter-in-law, played by Christine Dunford, but taking care of her during drug withdrawal 
is more than he can handle. He doesn't like to ask for help, but is forced to accept it from a neighbor, a nurse played by Patricia Richardson of TV's Home Improvement. You're an old-fashioned, ties that bind kind of guy. Whatever happens, you stay the course, isn't that right? Miss Hope, I'm just realizing I don't know enough about anything to say nothing. Yuli hates his son's old partners, played here by Stephen Flynn and Dewey Weber, but he has to deal with them because they're a threat to his family and his grandchildren. Call him off, Eddie. This isn't helping anything. The movie was directed by Victor Nunez, one of the unsung heroes of American independent filmmaking. His previous film was The Great Ruby in Paradise, and again here with Yuli's Gold, he takes his chosen turf, the state of Florida, and finds a rich human story to tell there. It's a very good film, and the surprise is Peter Fonda. No question. Uh, he will be remembered at Oscar time properly so. And you know what? The great directors, and I'm talking about Scorsese and Coppola, uh, Jonathan Demi, mm -hmm. and, and, and Victor Nunez is now threatening to enter this class, this mm -hmm. rarefied air. Mm -hmm. They know that actors who may have fallen off in popularity or whatever still have the bones the bone structure mm -hmm. and have lived a life and if they photograph them well in the right role can get great power out of it and, and, and victor news but i want to celebrate this guy a little bit more gal youngin was his first film yes he used to be called a regional filmmaker remember mm -hmm. when we reviewed his yeah, first picture yeah. gal youngin this is a major filmmaker now this yes. is a wonderful film L family life and again not, as you said not violence, it's all interior yeah, and violence. And what he does, actually, it's I not think he looked, he looked at Peter Fonda and saw something there, because Fonda has been, ever since Easy Rider, which was really his only other really good film, he's been miscast in these extroverted, violent roles, and right. Peter Fonda is not an extroverted person. Whatever is going on is going on inside, and yeah, this he movie is very interior and very quiet and very reflective, and although you feel that he has the potential to act out in a violent way. Uh, he doesn't seem to be that kind of person. He's a person who thinks it through and tries to figure it out, and it's just the right role and for him. And from the first shot, mm -hmm. we're hooked You've into this it. story. This is one of the year's best films. Coming up next, Wedding Bell Blues, about three girlfriends who decide to get married as a lark in Las Vegas. what do you think? I met the most amazing guy. We have a date tonight. Really? How does this most amazing guy know about the wedding part of the date? Three friends toy with marriage on a trip to Las Vegas in Wedding Bell Blues, the latest romantic comedy about the perils of tying the knot. With the national divorce right now at 50% and pictures like four weddings and a funeral and when Harry met Sally, such huge hits. Finding the Right Guy movies has now become its own genre. The film begins with one of the young women, Julie Warner, getting unwelcome news from her fiancé, Joseph Erla. I can't marry you. I know it looks goofy, but it does wash off. I can't marry you. I'm sorry. Okay, now it's not funny. So she and her pals pack it off to Las Vegas, where they each make a bet. Each one has to find a guy within a night and marry him. Here's the approach Julie Warner takes the cowboy played by John Corbett. Mickey, you're a great lady. You don't have to pay me money to marry you. I mean, I'd, I'd pay you money. Don't patronize me. I'm not. I, I don't know what that means, but I'm trying to. <laughs> and here's the ceremony for Paulina Poroskova's marriage, or at least the start of the ceremony. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are gathered here today to... Uh... Excuse me. Excuse me, would you mind if we cut in front of you? Hurry, honey! She's having a baby! And Bachelorette number three is played by Ileana Douglas. This is the morning after her wedding night. That was the most incredible sex I ever had in my whole life. I mean, ever. It was like eighth wonder of the world sex. Uh, can't wait to do that again. It's just something I do well. My problem with Wedding Bell Blues is that we meet too many characters, and none of them is taken very seriously by the filmmakers, or, and then obviously by us. I know it's a comedy, but it would be funnier if it were written and played more credibly. Also, Vegas wedding chapels are kind of tired venues for comedies, I think. I would have preferred something much more substantial, with the same idea, I guess, behind it, 
than Wedding Bell Blues. I didn't think the idea was that great either, but also I found the direction was kind of slack and the dialogue was too wordy and there were That's situations where urgency. the actors seemed to be kind of winging it or kind of trying to improve on the dialogue in the moment because they didn't quite believe yeah. in it. And the movie just didn't have the conviction. When you get to a comedy, right. you have to feel that everybody in the comedy really is, is convinced that they're on point and they yes. aren't here. Yeah, absolutely. Coming up next, a story of love and revenge from China. Gong Li stars in Temptress Moon. Moon. Directed by the Chinese filmmaker Chen Kaiga, whose credits include Farewell My Concubine, a fascinating story set in the brutal training schools of the Peking Opera. This new film begins in 1911 when the old emperor has been overthrown, and it tells the story of a rich but doomed dynasty, a family ruled by opium. The movie stars Gong Li, who is the leading Chinese actress. After her father dies and her brother's mind is destroyed by drug poisoning, she's given a responsibility as head of the family and immediately acts to fire her father's faithful concubine. Still later, in 1920s Shanghai, Leslie Chung plays a gigolo who specializes in blackmailing wealthy women. His gangster boss sends him back to the estate now ruled by Gong Li, where he spent some childhood years and where his own sister is still married to the disabled head of the household, Gong Li's brother. His assignment, seduce Gong Li so that his criminal boss can get his hands on the family's fortune. <laughs> the tragedy is he begins to really love her just when she stops loving him. <laughs> Temptress Moon is convoluted, hard to follow, melodramatic and unconvincing. It's not easy to really care about the characters. The film is visually beautiful, as so many films from China are, but I'm not sure in this case that's enough. It's not enough, but I thought that there was something else going on there. And, mm -hmm. I, I, and I think the issue is, whereas he's dealt with uh, all sorts of political issues in the past, mm -hmm. I think he's, in this case, dealing with the nature of how the sexual relationships between the relationship between men and women in, the, in this Chinese world mm -hmm. at this time kept people from actually loving each other. Mm -hmm. In other words, the revolution that's being dealt with here now and posited is a, a sexual uh, relationship between the two. You really got that out of this movie? Yeah, I actually did. Did you follow it? It is difficult to follow the story, but the key line that you used is when one falls out of love, one falls in love, and that's, I think, the key, yeah. fu that's the fulcrum of this picture. And so I think there's something, is it as good as the others? No, but is it worth following? We're seeing yes. Coming up next, our video pick of the week, another fine film from the director of Yuli's Gold. That's it. The Century Plaza, offering the finest in luxury service in Southern California style, adjacent to Beverly Hills on L.A.'s fashionable west side. The Century Plaza Hotel and Tower, a Westin hotel. And now it's time for our video pick of the week. And my pick this week is Victor Nunez's Ruby in Paradise, one of the films we referred to earlier, one of the best films of 1993, with a stunning feature film debut by Ashley Judd as a young woman in search of a career as she moves from Tennessee to Florida and finds just what she's looking for at a resort shop. Here she applies for the job with bold conviction. Mrs. Chambers, I've done retail before and I'll work real cheap. Ruby loves her job and the movie becomes a rare American film to take work, even a sales girl's job, seriously. So I like selling stuff, okay? Is that good? Five days of one thing for two of something else, fair enough. <laughs> But there's a problem. The owner's son comes on to her. And when Ruby fails to buckle under, she's out of work. Well, I can do just about anything right here. I bet it looks like it's No, I don't really Are you sure? Because there are plenty of people in here. I'm sure that you can just add me right in and I can do something just fine for you. Ruby in Paradise, my video pick of the week. Now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs up for Speed 2, Cruise Control, a truly rousing ocean liner adventure story with creepy Willem Dafoe threatening gutsy Sandra Bullock and gutsier Jason Patrick.
Two more thumbs up for broken English about tribal strife in New Zealand, intense energy and rage throughout. Two more thumbs up, way up, for Victor Nunez's Yuli's Gold, a family drama that features a remarkably good performance by Peter Fonda. Two thumbs down for the trivial Wedding Bell Blues, an overstuffed and kind of unfinished romantic comedy. And finally, we split on Chen Kaige's Temptress Moon from China. I admired the film's sexual political insights into China. Roger thought the story was too convoluted, although we both agree it is a great-looking motion picture. And by the way, you can check our votes and hear our reviews of many recent movies at our website. The address is www.siskel-ebert.com. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Batman and Robin, starring George Clooney as the newest Cape Crusader, and Arnold Schwarzenegger as his new enemy. And also, My Best Friend's Wedding, starring Julia Roberts as a woman who is none too pleased that her best friend is getting married. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. <laughs>